Uh, welcome everyone uh, to the Invasive Insect Workshop webinar. Um, my name is Jim Jasinski. I'm with OSU Extension, the IPM program. Uh, I'm in Champaign County right now, and I've got my counterpart here, my uh, co-presenter. Celeste, why don't you introduce yourself? You can. Okay, and I'm not muted. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Celeste Welty. I'm here in Columbus. Uh, I'm an extension entomologist in the Department of Entomology. There we go. Great. So we're going to go ahead and uh, sh start to share our screen. If you have any questions, please uh, avail yourself of the chat box. Okay, so here's our introductory slide. Uh, should be self-explanatory. And this is going to be the outline. So we're going to do and are doing the brief introduction. So welcome now. Then I'll tackle spotted wing Drosophila for about 20 minutes. Celeste will come on and talk about brown marmorated stink bug, and then about spotted lanternfly. And then we'll finish up with any questions. We have a short little evaluation, and then we'll be done. So it should be about an hour. Um, at the end of the webinar, uh, we are hoping that what you get out of this. Um, is kind of a refreshment on how to monitor and manage spotted wing and brown marmorated. And we're gonna talk in depth about the biocontrol of brown marmorated, which is great. And then we're going to um, also focus on the spotter and lanternfly biology and, and uh, identification and reporting procedures. Hang on here. There we go. Okay. So on to the basics for uh, spotted wing. Spotted wing is native to uh, eastern China, uh, Japan, the countries in that area. Uh, it got into Hawaii about uh, 1980 and about 38 years later made its way over to the mainland in California. Since 2008, it's spread um, almost all through the country. By uh, 2016, there's a couple of states that haven't declared it yet, but uh, we picked up our first spotted wing detection in 2011. And so we've been trapping for spotted wing ever since 2012. And basically, um, this is the current distribution map of spotted wing that we have. The red counties are positive. There's about 35 of those. Yellow counties, those are where we suspect we have spotted wing, but haven't been able to confirm it. The gray counties are places we've looked but haven't really found it. And white counties are areas we haven't surveyed yet. Uh, the number one up there, that's actually Van Wert County. That's the first detection we had in 2011. And then the initials JJ and CW, that just tells you where we're located right now for the webinar. So let's talk about the injury caused by spotted wing. This is kind of what uh, growers have been seeing over the years for spotted wing. It's a, uh, a vinegar fly that attacks healthy fruit, and that's what makes it different than other uh, Drosophila. And you can see that um, the infestation damages the fruit. You can see the larvae that are in the fruit, um, all kinds of small fruit, peaches, um, strawberries. Uh, those, are, those are fruit that can be damaged by spotted wing. So real quickly, the biology here is the, the females lay eggs about 350 eggs. Those eggs can hatch in anywhere from 12 to 70 hours. Uh, go through a series of three larval stages. Um, we can also call those maggots. Uh, then they will pupate either inside or drop out of the fruit into the ground, pupate, and about uh, four to 15 days later emerge as adults. So when uh, conditions are optimal, that life cycle can turn over about every 10 days, which can lead to a tremendous number of spotted wing being generated per season. So the question is, well, you know, why should we be monitoring? And, uh, you know, the, and the answer is we really need to figure out, you know, is this pest on your farm? And so to do that, we have to do some trapping. Um, we want to uh, figure out if the adults are there, if the adults are there, you know, that is what kicks off our entire uh, spraying or, or treatment program. And the threshold is really, you know, very minimal. It's one spotted wing fly, male uh, or female. Celeste, do you want to put your mute on for me? I can hear some rustling. Thank you. Um, and so the sprays are also, you know, not, not only just based on detection, but based on the fruit ripeness. Flies like to attack that ripening and ripe fruit. Okay, so in terms of monitoring, this is um, the current trap that we are recommending. It's a baited sentry trap, and you can see that it's down there in the bottom right, uh, bright red trap. Uh, 
that costs about $8. Uh, it lasts for several years. What goes inside of that trap, which actually attracts the spotted wing, um, is this lure, the century lure, and those cost about $6 a piece, and they last for about a month. Those two images on the left are the male and the female spotted wing. We'll see more of those. And uh, we did briefly try using these um, baited sticky traps, you know, which are, were supposedly easier to, to, to manage uh, at some point, but I didn't really find that it was much easier to spot them on there. There's a few other complications. So we're, we're not recommending the sticky traps right now, but we might revisit that later. Uh, so the lure draws in, attracts the spotted wing and some other insects, and then, you know, but it doesn't kill them. So uh, the top arrow you see there is pointing to the entryway into the trap. Once the flies get in there, they kind of buzz around, maybe get tired, maybe get thirsty, go down toward that drowning solution, and that's actually what traps them and kills them. Uh, so uh, there is no actual toxicant that's in that. It's just a mixture of about 25 to 100 percent apple cider vinegar and a drop of dish uh, detergent to kind of break the surface tension. So they actually drown in that solution, hence the term drowning solution. What are the seasonal trap trains you can expect for spotted wing? Uh, well, actually, we can detect overwintering adults almost all through the winter, and SLES has been able to catch them for a couple years in a row now in January. So they're a pretty hardy insect. They find ways to, uh, to survive the winter. Um, they come out of uh, the winter. If we put traps in wooded areas, we can catch them as early as, let's say, uh, mid, mid to late May. You know, so, they're, so we know they're active uh, at that time. Actually, in crop fields, typically our first detections, our first catches at a few sites can be in early to mid-June. And then mostly we catch them anytime from early uh, to mid-July. Uh, these insects build up over the summer and so really peak in September and going into October. Uh, so any sort of late uh, bearing fruit type plants are likely to have kind of a higher uh, chance of getting hit than those that mature earlier. We tend to have higher insect catches when it's cooler and wetter outside and lower catches when it's hotter and drier. This is kind of an overview of a, a sort of a, uh, a makeshift farm. And our basic rules of thumb here are, we look for about putting out two traps per acre. Uh, one of those traps by the edge of the field, one of them by the interior. And if you happen to have a woods nearby, maybe put it on the side of the field nearest the wooded edge. So raspberry is an early fruiting um, plant. It's a three acre field there. So we've got six traps out. You see a variety by the edges and through the center of the planting. Next will be blueberries, a two acre planting. We'll have four traps there, again, between the edges and the interior of the field. Grapes coming on last we'll go ahead and put you know, one by the edge and one in the interior. This is just kind of an idea of how you would space the traps in kind of a diversified farm. So then where do you actually put them in the field? Uh, well, you really want to put them right in the canopy, right by the flower clusters, right by where the fruit's developing because the, the bait is actually you know, competing with the fruit itself uh, for a spotted wing. Um, if you have a crop like raspberry, where the canes are sort of smaller and weaker, you may want to put a little shepherd's hook in there to put the trap on so it doesn't weigh the plant over and then maybe fall over and, and spill. And then we just got the, um, the trap attached there, you know, with a, um, a little uh, paper binder uh, actually up on the support cable. Once you put the traps out, you're going to need to service them. And the schedule is weekly. Uh, and then, you know, once you get the contents of all those insects caught in the trap, then you're going to have to transfer them over to something like a vial that can be taken into uh, maybe uh, where a microscope might be to identify those insects. So we have a video on the OSU IPM YouTube uh, channel that will show you how to do this. Okay, so then we have a basic sorting and ID uh, step as well. So we then take the contents from that vial, dump it into like a Petri dish, and then start to sort through it. Um, we would like that to be done within maybe 24 to 48 hours of it actually being pulled out of the field. Um, and again, we're going to be looking for these characters like spots on the wings, um, uh, the uh, little spurs or rows of uh, hairs that are around the front leg of the male. And the picture on the right hand side there is the female. And you can see that um, that ovipositor is expanded. And it's got that serrated sort of tooth look. Now you can identify these um, insects, you know, with this 
really pretty simple and expensive uh, micro, or, uh, microscope for about $100. So you don't have to you know, break the bank to be able to identify these, but a scope is definitely something we would recommend. So what kinds of insects are trapped? Um, well, possibly you might get the spotted wing drosophila. Not every time you put the trap out, you'll catch it. That's why we have to sort. Um, you'll find a lot of non-target insects in there as well that are roughly the same size, maybe even shape as spotted wing, other vinegar flies, other drosophila, things that have you know, markings on their wings. Uh, you might catch other um, larger flies, wasps, moths, beetles, spiders, mites. I mean, I've seen all kinds of things in there. Um, so really the, the trap catches can kind of increase through the season. And then when you change the lure, you might get a few more at that point as well. In terms of uh, what's a general deployment rule, I would say if you're a grower or consultant, you wanna put these traps out maybe one to two weeks prior to flowering. You're gonna to wanna to check those traps you know, weekly for adults. After you find that first spot of wing, uh, adult male or female, you can go ahead and remo remove the traps and then initiate the management program um, once those berries are either ripening or become ripe. If you catch spot of wing and you don't have fruit, you don't need to treat. And you're gonna continue that treating process all the way through harvest. So the question becomes, well, what are our treatment options? And Celeste has put together this wonderful chart that talks about the various um, sprays and uh, other factors that are gonna go into your decision tree. On the left-hand side, you can see the efficacy of the products are rated. On the next column over, you can see um, the mode of action is there in case you wanna rotate those products, the product name, obviously, uh, the residual spray activity, how long that spray will uh, be effective on those plants, and then the various crops there, and the numbers inside of those crops tell you what the PHI is between the applications. There's another slide that Celeste has generated that has actually, in addition to the PHI, the number of sprays you are allowed, because not every spray is allowed to be used all through the season. So some might be able to use you know, twice or three times or four times, and that information is, is good to know. So this is um, really kind of a, one, a great one-stop shop idea for where you can figure out what pesticides are available. I want you to notice as well, there are uh, four OMRI products um, for organic uh, growers, and Trust, Grandivo, Venerate, and Pyganic. So those are some options for organic growers as well. Moving on, if you don't want to treat, there are some cultural controls you can think about. You can use exclusion netting, and we've done programs uh, on that. You can think about trying to prune down the canopy. A thinner canopy uh, is not as um, friendly to spotted wing drosophila as a dense thick canopy. So think about thinning out the canopy. And also the use of weed fabric is going to uh, reduce the amount of uh, pupae that can get into the soil and complete their life cycle. So uh, think about those kinds of things culturally that might also reduce your spotted wing drosophila population. Lastly, uh, we're going to be talking about the saltwater test, and that's basically to figure out if your fruit are infested, even if you are spraying or doing these other cultural controls, you might find that some spot of wing uh, do get into the fruit. We also have a how-to video and fact sheet on how to conduct the uh, saltwater test. And again, it's kind of an evaluation of the spray program uh, or the cultural con control program that you have in place. Uh, the larvae levels in the fruit, you know, they might go up and down sort of based on the weather, uh, if it's uh, conducive uh, for their development, what insecticides you have used, what are the spray intervals, is your sprayer functioning properly, just a lot of variables. So you want to sort of keep on top of it on a weekly basis and figure out do you have infestations or not. You're going to want to you know, test that fruit roughly, you know, weekly through the, through the season until uh, you get done uh, harvesting. Another uh, tip or trick you might want to be thinking about is once you pick that fruit, um, you'll want to refrigerate as quickly as possible. Uh, that way it'll slow down or maybe even kill any larvae that might be in the fruit itself. Another cultural control that I didn't mention would actually be trying to harvest uh, on a two-day uh, interval, if at all possible. That will limit the time the fruit is, is exposed to spotted wing um, infestation. When you pick that fruit, it's important to pick healthy fruit. And so I try to show you here uh, what I think are good fruit to pick and, and bad fruit to pick. And if you see the fruit pulling away from the, from the, the cap itself, 
Um, that tells you that fruit has something going on. It may have spotted wing or some other Drosophila in there. So we don't want to uh, confuse the saltwater test uh, in, and maybe get a, a false positive. So be sure you're picking good, healthy berries for your saltwater test is the bottom line. If you uh, you know, put the salt in the water uh, according to, you know, one tablespoon per eight ounces, let it sit for about 15 minutes, you might start to see these things wriggle out of the fruit. Uh, they look like small, transparent grains of rice. That's sort of how you can uh, tell what you've got. If you've got other things in there, uh, you know, that might just be contamination, but this is what we're looking for, these small little larvae. In terms of um, resources, you know, we have, um, things that Celeste has put together on, on her uh, u.osu.edu page. Um, I also have some inf information that's been put up on uh, the OSU IPM YouTube channel, all kinds of videos about how to put the traps out, how to conduct saltwater tests, how to identify the spotted wing uh, Drosophila. You know, all this information is up there. Hopefully you can use it. We just put one up there uh, last December about exclusion netting. Uh, which has been pretty popular. So I would say go in and check that out. And we do have a new fact sheet uh, that just came out that's on Ohio line about spider wings. So if you want to get a, a little more holistic view, then you can uh, take a look at that one as well. So with this, I think uh, I'll stop. I'm a, maybe even a little bit ahead of schedule, which is great. We're hardly ever ahead of schedule. So I'm going to stop sharing right now and we'll go back and take a look in the chat box and, and see what we have. Okay, is it helpful to know if there is SWD in wild areas? Um, yes, so there are, I can't even tell you how many alternate hosts of spot a wing that are out in the wild. And those things that you've uh, mentioned there, those are definitely hosts of spot a wing. Um, we actually have a whole slide just, just full of possible wild hosts that that you could think about. Anything, any bush or tree or plant that produces kind of a soft skin fruit, that is gonna be susceptible potentially to spot a wing. Um, and there's, there's a lot of that out there for sure. Are there any other questions? I, I kind of went through that quickly because it's you know, sort of a review of, of most of what we've talked about before. But now we have a, a few minutes to kind of catch up on that a little bit if there's anything that anybody else wants to know about. Yes, yeah, spotted wing Drosophila um, can be a, a pest of peaches. We typically see these more later in the season, though. Um, I know, I think last year Celeste mentioned that we had seen if, uh, or yeah, seen more issues later in the season. Not, not so much when they're earlier. Um, and if Celeste has any other comments about the peaches and spot wing, she can, she can chime in. But I think it was more later season that we were seeing some injury in, in peaches. I, I don't, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't particularly remember it being later. It's because it depends so much on the variety. I think it's probably more typical, not in big commercial orchards, but more if people have just a few backyard trees mm -hmm. um, that they generally are not on a spray program. That's where we've been seeing it. Okay, okay, thank you. Any natural predators? Um, spiders actually would be a great predator for uh, spotted wing Drosophila, um, both those that make webs and those that don't. And I just read an article um, a day or two ago that they're looking at um, some parasitoids for spotted wing Drosophila, not here yet over, I think it was in Brazil or Central America, they were doing some research. Uh, but yeah, they're always looking for biocontrols, but at this point, we don't have a lot that would be commercially, you know, acceptable, I guess you'd say, like we're going to find out with brown marmorated stink bud with Celeste's talk coming up. But yeah, spiders would be definitely, you know, something um, that I would say would be uh, a very good uh, natural enemy for spider wing. Yeah, I think of the various studies that have been done, not in Ohio, they're finding what predation and parasitism is going on tends to be by generalists, um, that they hadn't yet found a specialist natural enemy that really, really homes in just on spotted wing. Um, so a lot of the, the generalist predators, ground beetles and um, other, uh, uh, and so there are some parasitoids that are known to be able to parasitize the pupae, but spotted wing has this ability to, um, oh, I can't think of the word, like block off, even if they've been parasitized, they can like block off. Encapsulate. Encapsulate yeah. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that they can still survive even if they there was an initial parasitization. So 
um, the initial news had been pretty bleak, um, but they're, they're always looking. There have been explorations in China trying to find something better. Yeah. Okay. Are there any oh. other? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Well, one thing, Jim, um, we had, I don't know if you wanted to bring up, what you and I had discussed what we were calling a stream, uh, a slightly more streamlined approach to trapping this year. And I didn't know if you wanted to comment about what we had in mind. Um, yeah, so I think what Celeste is alluding to is that uh, we might push back the start date to maybe mid-June. Typically, we're looking at the 1st of June and go for uh, a, a month or one entire lure uh, life uh, through about mid-July and then maybe transition to 100% apple cider vinegar um, drowning solution and bait at that point in time. So when you use the the lure itself, that that's what is attractive to the spot of wing. And then the killing solution, the drawing solution is is just there, you know, for that purpose. But if you pull the lure out, that century lure, and just rely on another attractant, what we found um, over the years, and lots of researchers have found over the years, is that apple cider vinegar is actually a pretty good attractant by itself. Uh, the lure that we use is, is slightly better in, in some ways, uh, slightly worse in other ways. Uh, but if you were thinking about, you know, you don't want to pay for the lure all season long, if you want to go with the apple cider vinegar 100%, that would be fine. Just remember to put that little drop of um, just detergent in there so they do get drowned uh, in you know, they don't just fly in to fly back out again. Um, I think that was the part that Celeste was, was talking about. And so we're, we're thinking about rolling that out. Um, and that way, you know, at the beginning of the season, again, the initial detection, that's the most important because when you find that first fly, male or female, uh, that's really what sort of triggers your management program through the entire season through harvest. So, uh, you know, once you do find uh, a male or female, Trapping at that point really doesn't have to continue, especially if you're a grower doing this you know, on your own. We do it in more of a research capacity to see how the population goes up and down with various uh, pesticide uh, schedules and treatments. Uh, but a grower probably doesn't get as much out of it as, as we would get out of it. Okay. All right, Good. well. Yeah, there, because I mean, maybe um, if someone hasn't done it before, the bottom line is once you have this lure, and you really get into midsummer, you can get this really overwhelming number of bugs you got to sort through, and it can be a really onerous task. So the idea is it's worth that onerous task if you're still looking for first detection, but once you're af past first detection, then if you go with apple cider vinegar, you don't get that huge amount of material you have to look through. So. Right, right. Okay, great. Well, I don't see any other questions in the chat box. So Celeste, you want to go ahead and do your brown mar marmorated to talk and then remember to, you know, sort of de-share after that. We'll yeah. do the same thing and then we'll go back into it. So. so hopefully everyone can hear me. I just have a new version of this software it was just put in this past week. So I struggled a little bit with some of the controls. So what I want to talk about now is the um, brown marmorated stink bug um, and with emphasis on some work we're doing on biocontrol. So here is the injury uh, on apples. You usually you see external evidence of the injury, but it looks really bad once you cut the, the skin of the apple and you see this um, corky tissue underneath. That is caused by the, this brown marmorated stink bug has this unusually long proboscis, a very strong, long proboscis that it sticks into the fruit and sucks out the, the juices. Um, he, this shows with the life cycle, we have several different uh, nymphal stages and then the adult male and female, they all feed on the fruit, but it's really the nymphs are like little feeding machines. Even though they're small, they just suck, 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 suck all the day and cause a lot of damage. The first in star nymphs that hatch out of the eggs are the only ones that do not feed on the fruit. So this is an exotic pest, meaning a pest that's from somewhere else, it's not native. So what, what happens with an exotic pest in general is when a pest arrives in a new area, there are no local natural enemies, so outbreaks tend to occur. And that's definitely what's been happening with brown marmorated stink bug. But then over time, some things can change. Sometimes our local natural enemies adapt and start attacking that new pest. Other times the exotic natural enemies arrive. In some cases, that's by the government bringing them in in releases or other times it's on their own. So that's what we really wanna talk about today. It's been known for quite a while that there's biological control by a tiny wasp called Trisulcus japonicus. Um, its official um, common name is now the samurai wasp. 
but those of us in the business tend to call it TJ. Uh, it's this tiny little wasp. So in the picture, you can see it is um, <clears throat> stinging. It's laying an egg in each of the, the white things here are the stink bug eggs. <clears throat> and the little wasp is laying an egg in each of those stink bug eggs. So it is an egg parasitoid. It's a specialist and it, it does attack other stink bugs, but it really specializes in attacking this particular stink bug, the brown marmorated. That's a lovely picture there of a, a brand new wasp just emerging from the uh, what was an egg of, of stink bug. So its history, it's been known in Asia to kill at least uh, on average 70% of the stink bug eggs. It's been in quarantine for years in Newark, Delaware but the government has been extremely reluctant to issue any permits for its release. So it's, although we know a lot about it from Newark, it still is just inside the labs there. Then everything changed. Starting in 2014, it was detected in the wild in Maryland. And then the following year, Delaware, Virginia, Washington, DC, and then out in Washington State on the West Coast. The next year in New Jersey, New York, and Oregon. So this was very exciting that uh, we could get it here without the USDA's help. Then in 2017, I'll be talking uh, in much more detail that Ohio was added to the list. In 2018, Michigan finally got in there. So the federal rules are that if something like this happens, if this um, exotic natural enemy shows up, you can do anything you want within a state, but you are not allowed to take it across state lines. So if you know, if you're trying to find out whether you have a parasitoid like TJ, uh, one of the typical study methods used is called sentinel egg mass studies. So what this involves is in the lab, you have to have a colony. So you collect eggs every day from the colony so you know they're fresh. And this is what the picture here on the right shows a typical leaf that has three different egg, fresh egg masses on it. Then we remove those from the leaf, glue them onto a little card, count them, inspect them to make sure they look okay. Then we take them out to the field. We clip the card to a leaf and leave it there for 72 hours. We flag the location so we know we can find it and remove it after 72 hours. Then we take that back to the lab and observe it, particularly that first week, but we hold it for at least six weeks afterwards. So what happens is in, if you see the picture here with the eggs that look a blackish color, that means they have been parasitized because normal healthy stink bug eggs do not turn black. And then what you see in the dish, if you can get a perspective, that Petri dish is only about an inch and a half wide. These little tiny black specks are these tiny little parasitoid wasps that will emerge from the eggs. So with our sentinel egg mass studies, um, this was, Ohio was part of a multi-state project um, the past two years where it was decided instead of putting these egg masses actually in the crop itself, we were gonna focus on the tree lines adjacent to a crop. So in this picture, this is a young orchard, apple orchard, and we were putting these in the tree line just very close, you know, a few meters away from the fruit. Or here's another example on the right, this is a cornfield, but we put them in these trees right adjacent to the cornfield. Um, Again, here is one of our typical Ohio orchards. This was a fairly large orchard um, where you can see all the straight lines or the regular orchard trees. But you see this, um, uh, there was this little arm of woody plants of woods that was sort of sticking out into the orchard. So in this yellow line shows where we were deploying the um, sentinel eggs for our study. There is an alternative of yellow sticky card sampling. So in this picture, you see in that tree line, a yellow card hanging there. The pros are that you don't have to have a lab colony of stink bugs and you can have a much larger sample size. However, there are some cons. It's messy. It's difficult to examine the cards for these tiny little wasps under a microscope. And if you do find any, the wasp is dead, but it could confirm that you might have the correct wasp. So um, using that method I just described, we did these studies in 2017. We ended up doing a total of 618 egg masses. We used very heavily one research farm because we often didn't have many egg masses on a single day. Um, we did get out to three commercial farms, which was you know, fewer than we had intended. Um, we had 37 egg masses out of that 618 that did have parasitoids. Um, 229 wasp specimens were recovered. And then my poor technician spent the whole winter working through these tiny, tiny little wasps um, getting species identifications. So 
lo and behold, she found the samurai wasp in two egg masses that had been deployed in early August of 2017 in Columbus, Ohio. But we didn't know this until March of 2018 that we had actually found the samurai wasp. So then that set the stage for 2018 where we really wanted to see could we find it again and could we find it alive. So in 2018, the samurai wasp was found alive and the first find was in late May, which was really good. That was early enough for us to get a colony started. So we started a lab colony, which was actually fairly easy. You just need stink bug eggs and dilute honey. So in this picture shows a tube with, um, it was an egg mass where they had emerged and you can see those little tiny specks are the wasps themselves. So we decided to try a project similar to what is being done in some other states to see if we could redistribute the wasp in Ohio. So it was um, several steps. The first very important step was to do pre-release sampling. So we visited 10 commercial farm fruit farms to see whether they might already have TJ. We did most of this in June, a little bit in July. And what we found, we put 15 egg masses at each of these farms in the tree line, and all of them were negative for the samurai wasp. So as far as we could tell, the, the wasp was not already present at those 10 farms. So then the next step would be to go ahead and we released them at five farms. And then for comparison, we had no release at five farms. That was done mostly in July, a bit into August. And then we followed that four weeks later by a post-release sampling to see what happened. So here's a picture of the release. We, had, we used 15 parasitized egg masses per farm in just a very, we concentrated them in a very small area in the tree line near a crop. Um, so here is a picture of my student worker um, putting them out. So wherever you see a pink ribbon is where we were hanging one of these mesh bags. So each, each egg of the 15 egg masses was in a mesh bag. We knew that the parasitoids were going to emerge about one day after we set them up. The mesh bag prevented uh, birds or predators of different kinds from getting at them, you know, before they could emerge. And then the um, the little wasps are so small they could easily fly through the mesh once they emerged. Uh, also in each of those areas where we had the 15 egg masses, we put a stake with a lure, a BMSB lure that's normally put in a trap. But in this case, we didn't put it in a trap. We just put it there to sort of bring in any stink bugs in the area. So they were congregating in the same place where we were, we were releasing the wasps. So our post-release sampling at all 10 farms, again, we used sentinel eggs, but we, at this point our colony was declining. So it was only about 10 egg masses per farm, in some cases fewer than 10. But the results, we did find the samurai wasp at one farm where we had deployed it, but no samurai wasp at the other nine farms. So you might think that doesn't sound too good. In fact, that's very similar to the results that have been coming in from some other states where they've done this, that often it doesn't seem like you get much recovery. So why not more? Well, for one thing, our sample size was very small. So it could be that the samurai wasp was there. We just were not able to detect it. it we also were doing this a little later in the season than ideal. Um, that probably their peak time is more like late July, early August. And we did some of this sampling um, several weeks later than that. So we definitely need to resample those same sites in 2019 to see if we do detect TJ. This is just a map showing where we um, did the project. <clears throat> Excuse me, the, the red dots are, are <clears throat> the five sites where we released. The blue dots is our comparison where we didn't release. The star shows our initial find was here in Columbus. And the, um, the red dot with the star shows where we did recover TJ post-release. So just a summary of what we did in 2018, we had had 832 egg masses deployed at 12 commercial farms, one research farm, 45 of them were parasitized. Out of those 45, 29 had the samurai wasp, 28 out of the 29 were here at our research farm in Columbus, and one at the commercial orchard. That was a lot. It was, it was a very large project to look at all those eggs, 20,000 eggs, one at a time. So there is some information we still need about the samurai wasp. We don't know much about establishment at a new site, the number of parasitized egg masses needed to seed the site, the min is there a minimum BMSB population needed to get this going? After establishment, there's some important questions that we don't know. 
uh, the answers to uh, the tolerance of the wasps to insecticides, either to direct spray droplets or dry residues, or we don't know about the searching ability of the wasps. We suspect if they could build up in this tree line near the orchards that they, they still would have the ability to fly in the orchard and, and search for stink bug eggs, but there's a lot of uncertainty about these questions, but a lot of people looking for the answers. So that's really all I wanted to say about our biocontrol project, and I'm checking my time. Um, I wanna just very briefly mention a few other topics uh, related to stink bug where there's a little bit of news, uh, microbes, traps, threshold, um, our Ohio survey, ghost traps and border management. So this will just be very brief, but to give you a taste of some other work that's going on. One is there is this microsporidian that is um, this microorganism that has been wiping out a lot of lab colonies around the country. And some studies have been done in field populations and it is out there in the field as well. So although we don't want it to wipe out our lab colonies, it could be something that could really help growers in the field. So more work's going on with that. In terms of monitoring, we started using this new style of trap in 2017. That's a sticky panel, double-sided, made by Trace, put on a five foot wood post. We've been changing the panel every four weeks. This year, we are gonna to switch to do more like a two week interval. The lure is called a dual, dual lure, a two piece lure made by Trace. The amazing thing about this, it lasts for 12 weeks, which is really, really long for a lure. Uh, here is a close up of the panel with the, two, the dual lure. These two different lures, um, both need to be hung together on the same trap. Uh, another new thing is the location of the traps that we're now putting them in this tree line adjacent to a crop rather than in the crop itself. So in this aerial view of one farm, you can see out here were the crop plants and here we put the traps on the tree line. We use three traps per site, 50 meters apart. This just shows a summary of the trapping we did in 2018 around Ohio, where there are three color codes. Our hot spots were shown in the, the red dots. Uh, there's sort of a cluster in southwestern Ohio, but also Jefferson and Portage. Um, we ha had some first time trappers up in northwest Ohio where they were mainly low density, and then the yellow dots are where we had more of moderate density. That's the average number of stink bugs per trap per week averaged over the entire season. Some work has been going on with thresholds for stink bug developed by USDA in West Virginia, where they're using two traps, one on the edge, one on the interior, and you count the cumulative capture since the last spray. Then once you hit a threshold, you're supposed to spray and then reset your count to zero, start over again. But this was based, they had a very firm threshold they felt very good about on a pyramid trap, which is the kind of trap we used to use, shown in that upper picture. And the threshold was 10 adults per trap. But uh, now that we've switched to the sticky, we need a new threshold. So our, the tentative threshold, it hasn't been completely tested yet, based on sticky panel trap is an average of four, a cumulative average of four adults per trap. This is showing the kind of information that can come out of trapping. So this was in my apple orchard, that's my two acre apple orchard that I have here in Columbus. And this graph shows the number of bugs in the total of three traps in one week. Um, over the whole season. And then um, the blue part of the bar is the adult males, the pink part of the bar is the females, and then the nymphs are, uh, the small nymphs are dotted and the large nymphs are green. So, and then these um, letters across the middle of the graph show our, our typical sprays in apple. PF is petal fall, 1C is first cover, second cover, and so on. So what we found is that we got, even though we put our trips out really early, we got almost nothing throughout May and June, but then right around the beginning of July, is when we started to get um, stink bugs. So it was really the third cover spray and fourth cover spray were the key times when we probably should have been trying to control the nymphs. And they got very high here in um, early September. In the future, there's a lot of interest in something uh, being called ghost traps, where you use a pheromone lure to attract the insects in, but instead of putting it in a trap, you put it next to a big piece of insecticide impregnated netting that has a a pyrethroid like delta methrin. And you'll find um, just this, uh, the bugs fly, they hit it and they die instantly and fall to the ground where you can count hundreds of them. There are a lot of trials going on about whether it's vertical positioning of this netting or horizontal positioning in the tree, next to the tree and so on. 
Another interesting study is being done with what they call trap trees as a border tactic. Um, again, by USDA in West Virginia, the results look promising. They're putting a high dose lure, higher than the normal lure, along the edge of the orchard every 50 meters. Uh, that is fairly expensive right now, but they're working on uh, a lower cost version. The idea is then you go in and kill the bugs only in those trees and the one on each side of this trap tree. So you're basically sacrificing a few trees uh, where you're congregating the bugs. They were having very good luck when they sprayed just those few trees every seven days. They're trying to get it to work out for a longer interval of 14 days. But then the latest thing is they're thinking instead of spraying, they're trying to use those ghost traps, that netting in those trap trees instead of spraying, which would be much less labor. So we're all um, very interested in, in the results they're going to get this summer. Another interesting um, border tactic is called CPR, or crop perimeter restructuring. This is trials mainly in New Jersey with apple and peach, where for stink bug, they're using weekly insecticide treatment, but only in the border rows. And then for the worms, the caterpillars, they're using mating disruption. And for all the other pests, they're getting a lot more biological control. They have very promising results for blocks that are under 10 acres. They're also doing some work over 10 acres, but they think it might not be working quite so well in those larger orchards. So that is it. We'd like to acknowledge funding that we've gotten from the Ohio Vegetable and Small Fruit Research and Development Program, the Ohio IPM Program, and a USDA a CRI grant. And that is the end of stink bugs. So now I need to stop sharing. Are we over time or on time, Jim? Yeah, no, I think we're uh, we're right on time. We've got a chance here to answer any questions in the chat pod. Let me pull that up. Um, when you're pulling that up. I want to show. I don't know if people. What I'm trying to show here is it's a little vial full of TJ. And what I'm trying to show is just how tiny. There are maybe about 100 of them in here. They're just teeny tiny little dots. So they're really, you know, they are wasps. Sometimes we hate to use the word wasps because people think of yellow jackets. They're much smaller than that, but they're really good guys. Yeah, well, I don't, um, <clears throat> I don't see any questions in the chat box proper, uh, but if people are late decision makers about questions, they can still put those in the box and we'll get to those here in just a few minutes. Um, otherwise, I say we continue on with the spotted lanternfly chat. So Celeste, you can take it away. So you've just heard about two pests that are in Ohio that we're dealing with. This one is not in Ohio, but it's really a potential pest that sounds absolutely horrible. So we just want to make sure you're familiar with it. Spotted lanternfly. So it is a new exotic pest from Asia, Lycorma delicata. Catula is the scientific name. It's a plant hopper, a big plant hopper. It sucks sap. It's about an inch long as an adult. It's a pretty poor flyer. That's good, but it's a very strong jumper. And as you'll see, it's a good hitchhiker. So it has these um, bright red hind wings that are usually covered up by the more transparent fore wings. It tends to look more just a light pink when it has its wings closed. So its damage is that it sucks sap right from, they, they feed mainly on the trunk of the tree, on the bark. So what you'll see in this upper picture are these weeping wounds of sap on the bark. They also excrete large amounts of fluid, this stuff called honeydew, um, and then mold, sooty mold grows on that. So in the lower picture, you see leaves just turning black from sooty mold. In terms of host plants, we're most concerned about it on grape, but it's also been known to feed on apple, cherry, hops, and various maple trees especially silver maple. But the key host, especially in the fall of the year, is a tree of heaven. It just loves the tree of heaven. They tend to congregate at, on the trunk at the base of any of these trees. I mean, that picture is just staggering, the number of bugs on there. Now this tree, so it does help if you know what the tree of heaven looks like. Uh, it has a compound leaf. It's very common along roadsides. And you know, it's considered sort of a junk tree. Um, but I know I struggled a little bit to identify it. The leaflets are very similar to both black walnut and staghorn sumac. So here's a picture of uh, a leaflet, not, you know, the full leaf is compound leaf, but this is just individual leaflets. They tend to have a smooth margin without teeth, and they usually have this little lobe near the base of the plant. 
terms of life stages, so you've already seen the, there's the adult with its wings closed, which is its typical position. The nymphs look really different. Most of the young nymphs are black with white spots, but when they get older, close to adulthood, they, they develop these red patches, but still with white spots. There are, apparently, there are other insects that people are, are getting these mixed up with. Uh, stories we hear from Pennsylvania. Um, such as the spine soldier bug nymphs, the green stink bug nymphs in two of these pictures, and even black-legged ticks, um, which to me look completely different, but I guess people are getting them confused. Uh, the egg masses have very different appearance depending on whether they're new or old. The newer egg masses are sort of gray and shiny looking. The older masses in the lower picture become more dried out and quirky and brown. The fresh eggs are laid mostly in September on all kinds of, of substrates, particularly trees and stones and like outdoor furniture. So there's a summary of the life cycle. You just saw those three younger instars of nymphs are the black and white, the older ones are red and white, and they're the adults. And you can see this big old egg mass being laid by the adult female, one generation per year. So we're really interested in the origin and spread of this. So here in this map on the upper right, you see the map of Pennsylvania as of 2017. The red dots are where it has been found. The green dots are where it's been surveyed and not found. So, you know, we try and say, ah, oh, we're way over here in Ohio, no problem. But the fact is, despite a lot of, a lot of efforts in Pennsylvania for them to stop it, it's still spreading. So this little table shows you it, it, its first detection was in 2014 in one county in Pennsylvania, then it went up to four or five, six, and then really in 2018 it's up to 14 counties in, just in Pennsylvania. So this lower map shows those 14 counties as of this year. But then the really scary thing is other states. So in this map it shows the first detection outside of Pennsylvania was in 2017 in Delaware, and then in New York, then in 2018, it was detected at least one live specimen in Virginia, New Jersey, Maryland, and Connecticut. There was also a dead specimen recovered in Massachusetts, but that doesn't count because it was dead. Um, and as you see the color coding here, uh, blue is where there really is actual infestation going on. Uh, in yellow is where live ones were found, but no actual infestation, like they were just intercepted. So how do they spread? It's thought that they can only travel about three to four miles per year on their own, you know, by their wings or their legs, but they are excellent hitchhikers. So in Pennsylvania, the uh, State Department of Agriculture has this whole long list of regulated articles um, that you are not allowed to move across um, from the infested area out. And this includes things like stones, plants, plant parts, yard waste, firewood, lumber, logs, stumps, Vehicles, including railroad cars, they seem to particularly like rusty vehicles. Uh, lawn furniture, grills, packing materials. So the quarantine has been in place trying to prevent the spread, particularly by these objects, where particularly eggs are often found. So for control, other, so quarantine has been their number one activity. They've also done a huge amount of egg mass scraping off of trees, sticky bands at the base of trees, um, that's primarily to catch the nymphs. And then there are about eight or 10 insecticides that they're looking at to see if they would kill the bugs. In terms of where to look for spotted lanternfly, in the evening or at night on the tree trunk, in the daytime, particularly at the base of the plant. Eggs on any smooth surface, and as we've already mentioned, particularly bark, brick, stones, dead plant tissue. So in Ohio, we have not yet had any sightings or suspicions, but if you see anything that you think might be this, we do encourage you to collect a specimen if at all possible, take a picture if possible, and then let us know. Us meaning in your county, your OSU County Extension Educator, or me, or any of my fellow entomologists in the OSU Department of Entomology, or anyone at the Ohio Department of Agriculture. And that is it. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen. And um, I do have one, um, I was at a meeting a couple years ago where they were giving out some dead spotted lanternflies. So just for, for the size perspective, if you can see that, it's a pretty big insect. Um, and here it, it has its wings sort of partially open. And they say it's very rare to see a single one. Usually when you see them, there are a whole bunch of them. So.
Oh, any questions on those? Yeah, great presentation, Celeste. Um, I don't see any questions coming in. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but yeah, we definitely want to keep an eye out for the spotted lanternfly. And the only good thing about it is that it's pretty conspicuous given its size. I mean, the spotted wing drosophila, by contrast, is almost invisible and uh, undetectable without a microscope. Um, so I guess if there's no other questions, then um, yeah, people saying they're going to look for it this season. There was one thing I wanted to mention briefly that was in one of the uh, webinars that Cornell put together a few weeks ago, and that is um, where they found concentrations of the tree of heaven and concentrations of the bug. What they've done is they've gone through and they cut down all the male tree of heaven uh, plants and most of the female plants, but those that were remaining, they went ahead and treated with an insecticide, a systemic insecticide, which went through the tree and then as the bugs would feed on that, they would pick up the insecticide and then, you know, sort of like a mass kill. So because there was no other food source around, they would go to that one remaining tree, which was treated, and then you'd have, you know, a really large uh, amount of kill, uh, you know, so that was one thing they were experimenting with. You know, again, we're just trying to make you uh, aware and vigilant that this pest is kind of on our doorstep and uh, with all the commerce back and forth between these states you know just just to be aware of it this recording will be posted on the osu ipm youtube channel if you want to review any part of it or if there's something else you want to follow up in person with celeste or myself we're available um, so if there's no other questions um, i appreciate your attendance and uh, we'll catch up with you sometime during the season